I'm Petty Officer Alec Jacobs, and we are here for the all-hands call with the Chief of Naval Personnel. We'd like to thank everyone watching at home and, of course, our live studio audience here at Fort Meade, Maryland. Our special guests today are Chief of Naval Personnel, Vice Admiral Bill Moran, and, of course, Fleet Master Chief April Beldo. Right. Today we have the CMP and the Fleet, and they are here to address your concerns. These are the people who really are going to affect your life in the Navy, so make sure you ask them some tough questions there. Ten feet away, all right, it might not get closer. We're talking about pay, quality of life, duty stations, all that is up for grabs today. And of course, we'll be taking your live questions on Facebook and Twitter at the hashtag AskCMP. And if you want to see the behind the scenes look of the production, make sure you check out Periscope, which we're going to hit on a little bit later. We also have live, beautiful San Diego in the show, Norfolk and ships at sea. Admiral, fleet, like we talked about, no softballs today, okay? No softball. <laughs> Roger that. Our first pre-recorded question is coming to us from the Carl Vinson, which affects all sailors. Good afternoon, sir. Anthony Toriello, Commander, United States Navy. I'm the Intelligence Officer on USS Carl Vinson, CBN 70. My question to you today, sir, is with all the news in the uh, Department of Defense on restructuring a lot of the personnel issues, what are you doing, sir, to look forward towards restructuring a lot of the 401k and TSP uh, issues that are going on and making sure that we are continuing to be competitive uh, with our corporate uh, peers inside the United States of America. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Commander, thanks a lot for the question. Uh, you probably have read quite a bit here lately about the uh, Military Retirement Commission that was formed up uh, over a year ago and came out with a series of recommendations uh, out of their study. Uh, one of them included uh, changes to many of our benefits and compensation packages. Uh, key among them, though, was the discussion about uh, what we're going to do differently uh, about retirement for members of the military service. And so they have put forward a series of recommendations. Uh, the, all the services were allowed to participate in working groups to discuss those and what the impacts would be and what we thought about them. Uh, and then those recommendations went forward to the Secretary of Defense, over to Congress, and Congress uh, both houses of Congress have included language in the, the current authorization bill that's out there. Uh, it has not been signed by the president yet, so it's not law yet. But there is a recommendation in there uh, to change our retirement program in the future. It will look very much like, uh, if, it, if it holds true to form, it'll look very much like what you described, a 401k type of uh, vehicle. Uh, that you would see anywhere on the outside for most, in, most, uh, corp in most of corporate America. Uh, it'll, but it will also continue to provide uh, some of the same functions we have today uh, in terms of a defined benefit after 20 years. Uh, so it's a combination of uh, retirement programs that we see across America. Uh, I am very confident that uh, if, those, uh, if that law gets signed out by the president, uh, I think the language currently shows that it will be implemented in 2018, so in about three years, two, two, two to three years. Uh, and anybody on active duty prior to that point uh, keeps the retirement program we currently have. So we are all grandfathered in on the current retirement program. And then any new sailors who join the Navy after that implementation date in 2018 will be subject to the new retirement program. Uh, and if you, as a young sailor especially, if you, if you read this new program and say, boy, I really kind of like this one better than the one that I have today, there will be an opportunity, we believe, to opt into that program. So you will be, you'll still have choice, uh, but you won't be required to shift to the new program that's defined in the law. So it's a great question, uh, and I think it, that program, if it is instituted and becomes law, will actually provide all of us uh, a greater degree of flexibility in the future that I think will be attractive to a lot of young sailors. And sir, I think that kind of goes hand in hand with the SecDef's Force of the Future initiative, which has been one of his driving goals since he took office, that individuals nowadays want that flexibility. I think that ties right into it. All right. Our next question is coming live from Norfolk. Norfolk, go ahead with your question. Good morning, sir. My question is, what can you do to help the communication between command and family liaisons, especially here in Norfolk, where that communication is very much so lacking and leaving us families here in the dark the majority of the time? Well, I'm sorry, who are you? I am Natalie Price. I am a military wife. 
Okay, Natalie, thanks for the question. I, you know, frankly, I'm disappointed to hear that you're having trouble uh, getting communications from your command. And so uh, I, I'll certainly relay that back to the fleet commanders and down to the COs to make sure that we're doing a better job of being more effective in our communications. My, my, uh, my experience, having been around, and Fleet and I both see a lot of the fleet, is that sailors feel pretty good about the communications, uh, but we often forget about the important, as we call it, the 51% of the vote at home uh, who also need to get the information, the same level of information that you all get as sailors. We, we owe it to our family members to get it too. So from my perspective in N1, we put out uh, very open communications every week in a thing called the Weekly Wire uh, that we're happy to share with anybody who wants to, uh, to get that information. All the command master chiefs get it today, uh, and then we open it up to anybody who wants to go online and get it directly from us, and we'll, we'll, send, we'll post on our, our webpage how to, how to apply for and subscribe to that Weekly Wire, and that information will be available to uh, to anybody who, you know, family member, or spouse, or otherwise. Now, that takes care of the big Navy picture. You're, you're probably focused more on uh, specific command-related information about deployments, about uh, policies that affect you and, and your spouse. And uh, all I can tell you is that we will make sure that gets shared down the chain of command so that people out there are, are uh, paying close attention to getting information to their commands and their spouses and families. Thanks for bringing it up. Great information, sir. Next, we're going to check in with our social media center where Petty Officer Gabi has been monitoring Facebook and Twitter all morning long at the hashtag AskCMP. Social media, what do you have for us? MC2, things are going great right now. As you said, we've been getting those questions in on Facebook and Twitter at the hashtag AskCMP. Right now, we're also on Periscope. You can follow us behind the scenes at USN People for, to, to follow what we're doing around the studio. We have a question from, from Twitter from... Y, YK2 Sunshine, she would like to know, CMP, can, reserve force ex, can, can the reserve force expect more ADSW, ADT ops in fiscal year 16 than we had in fiscal year 15? I will say YK2 Sunshine, okay. Um, great, uh, great question. I, I, the, as everybody knows, we are in a pretty tight fiscal environment. And uh, we, balance, we try to balance the needs of the fleet uh, through ADT and ADSW uh, to meet certain needs uh, and capabilities uh, at the staff level in the fleet and other places. So uh, I, I can't tell you precisely because we're under a continuing resolution. We do not have a budget yet what that outlook's going to be. Uh, but we know and we appreciate the value very much of what the reserves bring in support of the active force. And we'll continue to fight for that money every opportunity we get. Our next question is coming to us live from the USS Eisenhower, which is at sea. Eisenhower, go ahead with your question. Good morning, sir. I'm Navy 2 France. I work in the engineering department on the ship. Our question is, in regards to the retirement change, how do you uh, well, I'm all Sorry. <laughs> how do we keep uh, new personnel and new civilians interested in joining the military after all these uh, large changes in the, the retirement plan? Yeah. So, hey, thanks, Ike, for the for the question. And uh, back to the, this whole notion about uh, the concern that the new retirement plan might actually uh, be uh, something counter to what we're trying to do, which is uh, continue to attract the best young men and women to join the Navy. Uh, I think what we hear from a lot of the millennial generation and other younger generations out there that are considering service in, in uniform is they want, they want to join a, an organization that has a greater degree of flexibility and choice and opportunity. And, and then when you really peel this back on this new retirement program, that was the, the commission's intent as well, was to try to bring and uh, modernize our retirement program that cl more closely matches the competition we see on the outside. So I, I don't think it's going to be uh, something that distracts us from being able to attract young men and women. In fact, most of the audience in here, if I asked you when you were at your recruiter office, if the first question you asked was, hey, tell me about the retirement plan in the United States Navy, you prob that's probably not the first question you asked. Uh, when when uh, the data is pretty clear that only 15 percent or so of sailors who join the Navy ever reach 20 years in a retirement. 
so retirement really isn't on the minds of recruits so much as it is once they get established and they say, hey, you know, I might want to make this a career or I've got a family and I'm concerned about whether I'm going to be able to have an affordable lifestyle in the future, that becomes much more of a planning factor. Uh, but I think when you look at this new retirement program, uh, once it becomes law, you, you might look at it and say, hey, this is going to give me more flexible options earlier in my career than the current retirement program, which is all or nothing at 20, correct? You got to go to 20 to be able to be to be vested and be able to have an opportunity to retire. Uh, the new program will will have an opportunity earlier to and then transfer that and make it portable across Navy to other corporate uh, and other industries out there. So I think you're going to find it's pretty attractive to a lot of people. Thanks for the question. Two questions so far about money. I'm surprised that sailors care about money, right? <laughs> All right, we're going to go a little closer to home where we have a studio audience member waiting by. We're in Admiral Fleet Master Chief. CTI 2 Davis, I'm stationed here at Nyack, Maryland. Uh, my question is in regards to the career intermission program. My understanding so far is that 2015 was the last year of the pilot program. Um, and so I'm wondering where we're going with that and if it looks like it's going to be possible to implement that permanently in the fleet. Yeah, another great question. It has been a pilot program for the last six years or so. And the Navy is the only service that's taken advantage of it in those six years. And we found it to be a very useful tool to talk to sailors who are, are struggling with whether to stay in the Navy because they've got a competing uh, personal or professional interest that they, they want to take care of. Whether it's starting a family, going to school, taking care of a parent, taking care of a child. Uh, career and admission program is, a, is an option to, to delay your or put your uh, service in the Navy on hold for a period of time without losing the opportunity to come back. So uh, in the current National Defense Authorization Act that has not been signed into law yet, there is a provision that we, the Navy, asked to be put in as a legislative change that expands the CIP program much larger than the current pilot program which in effect takes it from a pilot to an institutionalized program. So we're very optimistic about this, that it will become law, and once it does, then, then we will make that known to everybody in the fleet. Thank you. Thank you. Fleet, anything to add? I'm sure you're, you're standing up there with a lot of knowledge. Uh, well, you know, just a little. But the only thing I want to add, and I, I appreciate the question, and what I want to make sure that everybody understands that that program is for officer and enlisted, and for our all sailors, bottom line, that qualify for the program. So there's not just this one group that we're trying to target. It's for everybody. Great That's point. the most important thing. Yeah. Thank you, Fleet. All right, we're going to go. Uh, we have a phoner from HS, HSC2 in Norfolk. Norfolk, are you there? Press instructor at HSC2 based in Norfolk, Virginia. My question has to deal with uh, officer retention. Uh, sir, we've already heard from you a lot today about uh, the Navy's changes coming for the retirement program and the flexibility that it can give to people who want to possibly pursue a different career path. So what my question is for you is uh, for those officers who are looking to stay in to actually retain command or to make a decision at that pivotal point, especially with aviators, uh, just what it is the Navy's plan to possibly incentivize staying in to that 20-year mark to get their first major command, especially in the light of poor performance as far as uh, 04 and uh, department head uh, results, especially uh, in comparison within the aviation community uh, compared to other unrestricted line um, uh, communities, sir. So I guess what my question is is, um, do you think that the Navy has an officer retention plan, and what is, what is the Navy's plan to possibly uh, uh, help it out? Anyone in the audience have a question? We are, we are up here before, and I know we've got some, some great ones out there. Good morning, sir. Chief Good morning, Chief. Welcome to DMA. We're happy to have you on the seat. Sir, every year when we go, as we go through the uh, processes, first classes are selected for chief. We still have some of those first classes that have been slated for orders. How does the process work to get them out of those first class orders into chief orders, sir? Sure. Fleet, you want to start there? I will, sir. Um, well, first of all, um, and I'm glad you asked that question because we had a sailor at our command that had the same situation. So what we try to do is re um, continue the comms with the detailer and the command that they're going to. Because sometimes that command is like, wow. 
I have a chief coming to me now, and they still want to, that sailor to execute those orders. So it's not always about automatically getting that sailor out of those orders just because they have been selected for chief, vice, first class. There's that open communication between the detailer, the member, and the command that they're going to to make sure that's the right fit and they have all the qualifications that that new command wants. Because you have to remember, that command is counting on that sailor to come on that particular date. So if we have to change the process, they might have to wait. So most commands want them to continue on with the process of transferring. Sam P, anything else? No, that's good. You know, as, as you know, when, when that chief's list comes out and we, when we pin on chief uh, around the fleet, um, our first interest is getting that chief experience back to sea mm -hmm. or, or to the operational units where, where the sea or shore. So that becomes a major consideration on, on how we redistribute that talent. Great question. Yes, sir. How are we doing? We're doing good, sir. We're going to check back in at our social media center where Petty Officer Gabi has been monitoring the hashtag AskCMP all morning long on Facebook and Twitter. Petty Officer, anything trending in there? MC2, right now the hot topic is BCA standards. And just a reminder, we're still on Periscope. You can follow us behind the scenes. MC2 Burleson from CMP's office is following very tightly. MC2, what do you see going on? That's right, MC1. Here, I'm, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on Periscope. We have 58 people following on Periscope, so keep following on, on uh, Periscope. And here, we're on Facebook. We have a question from Mark Bartholomew. He asked, why were the BCA standards changed? Great question. Uh, mainly because we, everywhere we went for the last year and a half in the fleet, uh, one of the top hot topics we heard from everyone was when are we going to change the PFA, in particular the BCA standards or, or the policy on BCA standards. So we've been, we studied that for well over a year, had active participation with the fleet and came up with a different set of metrics uh, and ultimately decided after talking to BUMED and uh, a lot of folks that uh, look at this, the science of what's health, healthy and what's not healthy, is that you really can't, you can't tell uh, precisely what BCA standards define health and non-health. What does define better health is what's your blood pressure, what's your cholesterol level, are you, are you subject or, or you have a history of diabetes in your family, heart trouble, those sorts of things. But we don't pay a lot of attention to that unless you have health problems and you see a professional. Uh, and then what the PFA has become over time is a, is a punitive kind of step towards are, are you, do you look right in uniform? Do you look healthy? Uh, and I think all of us would agree that you can tell somebody who doesn't look very healthy if they're extremely overweight. But there are, there are margins in there that we needed, to, we needed to figure out so we could have a better assessment. Last year we threw out over 1,500 sailors in the United States Navy for, for BCA failures. 1,500 sailors, some of them enormously talented sailors, some of them who quit and decided, you know, I'm not going to take care of myself and I'm done with the Navy and uh, didn't care and they left and they should have left. But for those who really wanted to stay but were built differently um, and maybe had, had issues that they needed to continue to work on or we didn't give them enough counseling on nutrition and, and, better, sta and better ways to uh, maintain your weight and your health, uh, we thought we would be more, uh, we would have a wider variance in our BCA standards to get more people to take the PRT uh, and, and then truly decide whether if you could pass the PRT, then certainly you were good enough, healthy enough to be able to, co to, to assist your shipmates at sea in stressing situations. That ought to be the ultimate test, is whether you can actively participate in, in physical activity on the ship when, when you need it the most. And you could argue that big people um, that, are, that, are, that are muscular and, and are, are heavier than others uh, might be more valuable to you in some combat situations than others. And so the bottom line is when, when we looked at the BCA standards, you look at the Marine Corps, the Army, and the Navy, and the Air Force, they're all different. If they're all different, who's right? And you can't really answer that question so when we look at the science, there is an obesity standard out there that the American Medical Association and others use, and that's where we took the limit to, of our BCA. If you're above those limits, then you're obese and you must come back down or you will leave the Navy. And that's really what we did on the change to the PFA. We changed nothing on the PRT, and there are, there's plenty of argument that we could probably refine that, but we're going to do this one step at a time. Start with the BCA see how we do, 
and then maybe adjust the PRT at some other point. But that's fundamentally it. And it gives everybody an opportunity to reset their clocks if you want to stay. And you have up until the end of this calendar year to get there. And if you decide that you don't want to do that and you want to leave the Navy, fine, we're going to let you go because you're a BCA failure. But if you really want to stay and you feel like you got a shot, we're going to give you that opportunity. So that's kind of it. Fleet, you want to add anything? Um, and um, the only other thing was um, we st also took into account it's not, and I think same for you said this, it's not just about the physical part. It's about the Navy um, um, investing in making sure that you are eating right, you have the education. We're talking about looking at some of our galleys and um, some of our food courts on the base, things like that where you are going to eat healthier. And that's what it's all about. It's about a culture of fitness and health. Life's just the physical piece. So thanks. Yeah, and we're, do, we're doing other things to put our, the mo our, the money where our mouth is. Uh, think, think about um, expanding CDC hours on the front end and the back end of the normal CDC hours so that people have single moms, single dads have more opportunity to drop their, their child or their children off so that they can go work out. That has been a restriction in some places in the past. Uh, we all understand we need to increase the capacity of our CDCs to allow for more opportunity to do that. We are piloting expanded gym hours, 24-hour uh, gym fitness centers around the world today. CNIC is doing some of this to see if, if there's a greater utilization if you open up the gyms 24 hours a day. And so there are modifications being done today to allow us to do that. So those are steps we're taking to, to Fleet's point to, to continue to support the culture of fitness in the Navy as opposed to just talking about BCA standards, which is the wrong discussion. All right, great stuff, great stuff. We're going to go live to San Diego now where we have a sailor and a family member standing by. San Diego, can you hear us? Yes, good morning. Um, as a Navy spouse, I have supported my husband through several deployments. However, I've also supported several friends through multiple PCS moves. I was wondering what steps, if any, is the Navy planning on taking to limit PCS moves throughout the sailor's career? Yeah, great question. And you, you know, it's really, really not nice of you to have that backdrop uh, on in Washington D.C. You got a beautiful backdrop of, of the break and surf right there in Coronado, is my guess. Uh, but I, I appreciate that question. And, and you know, our interest is to try to spend as little money as possible in in the PCS account so that we can afford to do other things. So moving you less is a good thing. Um, but what we, are, what are we are lacking in the Navy in some respects, depending on what rate you are and what fleet concentration you have, uh, you, you currently live at, is the seashore rotation opportunities that allow you to stay in an area. So we're, we are certainly biased towards fewer moves than more moves, uh, but we've got to open up opportunities both sea and shore at the major fleet concentration areas to a larger degree. In the last two years, we've uh, added a lot of billets back into those, sh uh, those shore uh, duty opportunities where we, we would call it uh, operational readiness units like, um, like your SIMAs, like your ATGs, that we took manpower away years ago and figured out that that probably wasn't a good thing for us to do. So we bought back a lot of those billets and we're starting to fill those up. Uh, the more we do that, the more opportunity we'll give sailors to be able to stay in one location and not have to PCS as much as we have in the, in the last uh, five or ten years. Hopefully that answers your question. Flea, you got anything you want to add? No, on? I just want to say and thank you for your support Absolutely. as a family member for your spouse and for other family members. All right, great stuff. We're going to check back in with our social media crew, a Petty Officer Gabi. How are you guys doing in there? MC2, everything's going great. We keep getting more and more questions on Facebook and Twitter at hashtag AskCMP. We just got another one in from Twitter. Mark would like to know, recruiters in the field are struggling to find increased numbers of female applicants. What can CMP do to help? You want to start? I'll start. Um, uh, yes, and I appreciate the question, and thank you for what you do as one of our recruiters out there in the field. And we understand that um, um, it is sometimes difficult to, um, to attract, there you go, to attract the quality um, personnel that we're trying to get in the Navy, whether that's male or female. But I know that um, you're doing hard work out there. One of the things that uh, we talked about is maybe putting more females in those um, stations so that when those applicants or future sailors come into the stations, they will see that role model. Um, that's one of the um, um, initiatives that um, CNRC is working on. Also, this um, interactive um, recruiting. 
where um, I don't even have to come into the station. Maybe I can just see somebody or talk to somebody, get on my iPhone and talk to um, somebody who looks like me, sounds like me, who served like I want to serve, and be able to connect with that. So those are some things that I think that CNRC is working on so that we can increase our um, percentage and number of um, female sailors coming into the Navy. Sam Peter? Yeah, so one of the challenges we have is we, 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 uh, we measure propensity, that is your desire to want to serve in uniform, in, a, in any service, or as a policeman or fireman, whatever you want to do. Uh, and a propensity of young women to want to serve in the United States Navy is far below what young men is. And so what do we, what do, we do to change that calculus? Well, first of all, we've got to speak, to Fleet's point, we've got to speak directly to young women in America to, to let them know that there's an opportunity for them to serve in the United States Navy. Uh, so we have to change our focus on marketing and advertising. We have to be more focused on our social media content. We have to do a lot of things that speak directly to young women out there to, to see if they are more propensed and to get more of them interested in serving in the Navy. I think once we do that, you'll see a larger number uh, of applicants coming forward and being able to uh, sign up to join the Navy. And there are great stories. I'm looking around this audience, and a lot of young women in here who have uh, you know, d decided to join the Navy and wear the uniform and are, and are probably having some wonderful experiences that you need to communicate to your peers and to young men and women out there to get them to understand your story and maybe they'll connect in that way. So you gotta help us as much as we can help ourselves. CMP, I was gonna add on to that because we are all recruiters, yeah. not just the folks out in the field with the NEC. I'm sure Fleet, you standing right up in that spot next to the CMP can't hurt recruiting too bad either. There you go. go. <laughs> Come join the Navy. There we go. All right, we're going to head back to Norfolk. Norfolk, are you there? Yeah, this is uh, CS1 Lee. I'm stationed on the USS Jason Dunham here in Norfolk. Uh, my question today is uh, regarding the Chief Selection Board. Uh, once you find out you did not you did not make chief and you weren't selected, is there another way just besides CDBs and uh, regular mentoring that we can actually have something more on paper, more concrete to find out exactly what we need to work on to uh, take our leadership to that next level? CS1, let me let me give Fleet an opportunity to answer that first because she's been part of many boards and uh, been part of a, a process we instituted last year that it continues this year, and then I'll I'll follow up when she's done. Well, CS1, thank you for the question, and um, you are absolutely right. We have um, put into effect after each board. Now, there's some information in the board that we cannot share, but there is some information that those board members can go back to their commands and um, share with, to your point, with the states have CDBs. But what we've also put um, out is a, a lessons learned type um, um, newsletter that one of our um, advisors to the president he works up for us, and we send that to all of our um, um, command master chiefs, and I suspect that they're making sure that that's getting down to the deck plates. Um, but one of the things that I want to share with you is we, I was able to do a video with Force Master Chief Mitchell this um, postseason of the uh, results coming out. And one of the things that we talked about is the first classes out there are always trying to find out what didn't I do? What, why wasn't I picked? What is wrong with me? And shipmate, I want to tell you, sometimes there's absolutely nothing wrong with you. You have done everything we've asked you to do. You have a sustained superior performance. But as you know, we are limited to the number of selections that we can make in each rate. And sometimes that's just the only problem. It's not you at all. It's the process that we have where we select to vacancies, and we just didn't have any more vacancies. So don't ever think that there's something wrong with you if you didn't make it. Talk to your chain of command. Please um, ask about this, some um, lessons learned that we put out, and then continue to do what you're doing. Continue to do what you're doing, and you will get in there. Yeah, so, uh, so Fleet brought, CS1, Fleet brought up the point I was going to make, and that is last year we started putting the senior advisors to the board presidents uh, in their force master chief level, and, and, their, and their sole purpose in there is to, is to observe the board from every different rating uh, and, and making sure that uh, they're being able to uh, figure out and, and articulate what the trends are, what the qualities are that the board valued, so that sailors that are in your position get to look at that and say, okay, there's a weakness in my record based on the feedback I'm getting. Uh, and to Fleet's point, if we can't use 
we can't come back and give you direct feedback about your record. Those are board proceedings. But we can talk about the general uh, values that the board had. And they do change from board to board, depending on the makeup of the board. But the fundamental principles of a board process are pretty consistent. It's the nuances that I think you're interested in. Is there anything I can do to strengthen my record, to strengthen my, my package so I'm, more, I'm, I'm a better candidate next time, uh, uh, subject to the vacancies that, that Fleet brought up? Uh, it'll give you a better shot at making chief. All right, great stuff. We're going to check back into our social media center where Petty Officer Gobby has been monitoring the hashtag AskCMP all morning long on Facebook and Twitter. Petty Officer, how are you guys doing in there? MC2, things are going great. MC2 Burleson and I have been speaking after monitoring these questions. We're getting a lot about Seaway process. MC2 Burleson, can you tell us about what you're seeing? That's right, MC1. So, uh, Facebook and MC1 have a lot of questions about Seaway, and this may be a question for you, Fleet. Um, the question is asking, what is Seaway and what is the process? What is Seaway and what is the process? Well, Seaway is a, um, a tool that we use to um, make sure that we are not overpopulating any of our particular rates. So, for instance, um, um, I'm an AZ2, and it's time for me to reenlist. And at my reenlistment, year out from my reenlistment, there's a process and a tool that our um, career counselors use to sit down with you, counsel you, and see what are you qualified and if there is space in your particular rate for you to reenlist. And you'll sit down at the computer with your career counselor. You'll put in your application because you're going to request to reenlist. And at the seven month mark, that's when we start letting you know you might not want to stay in AZ. You might need to be a CS. You might need to be an IS or an IT. But we give you all that information well in advance so you will be able to make a decision prior to your EAOS and get an option to stay in the Navy if that's what you want to do. So the bottom line is, is it's a tool that we as the Navy, our career counselors, our Manning uses to manage all of our different ratings to make sure that we don't overpopulate them. When we see one of them being overmanned and then we see a rate that's undermanned, if you're choosing to reenlist and stay a part of this great organization, we might ask you to convert to one of those rates. Or if your rate is healthy and you want to reenlist and there's a quota for you, then we allow you to reenlist a quota. So basically, it's a, uh, a tool for us to monitor and make sure that we are managing community health. Hope that answers your question. I didn't make it too complicated. All right, sir, we saw, we saw how jealous you were of the San Diego weather, so we figured we we're going to take you right back there now. San Diego, go ahead with your question. Good morning, Admiral. My name is Lieutenant Damon Goodrich-Hauska. I'm a warfare tactics instructor for the Navy Service and Mine Warfighting Development Center. Sir, our, uh, the witty model is based off of the successful history of Nautic over the last 40 years of investing in their junior officers to create tactical experts. The service warfare community has historically had a low retention rate after the four year of service mark. What is your perspective on how the service witty program will affect the composition of the force in the future? And will investing in the training education of our junior officers be enough to revitalize the service warfare community, sir? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I am really proud of what I see out of the surface community uh, over the last year, year and a half. Uh, leadership uh, at the uh, SURF 4 and in PERS 41 and PERS 4 have really taken this on in, in a way that's creative, it's innovative, uh, opening up different career opportunities, different career choices for young SWOs that are trying to decide whether they want to make the Navy a career or not and balance that, balancing that against personal uh, uh, aspirations across whether it's a different type of work you want to get into or uh, have an opportunity to get postgraduate education and other things. So those, those uh, different career paths are being, uh, uh, being promoted out there right now by uh, the detailers and others and, and I'm sure you've heard about that. Uh, I, I think the, the, the WTI concept has worked enormously well because it's, it, it's a demonstration of tactical excellence in any community. So for the service community to move to that designation and really value young men and women who have a desire to want to be the best warfighters they can possibly be is a very positive step for the service community. And recognizing that in a formal way, through a formal training program and then bringing back the best of those WTIs to the schoolhouses where they can impart their knowledge and experience on the next generation of young SWOs coming up. 
I think it'll have a very positive effect. We're already seeing it in retention rates across the uh, surface community. Uh, when I first got in the job two years ago, the, the data was pretty clear that we were down in the, the, the low to mid 30s of retention rate uh, to department head in the surface community. Uh, today, we're, we're approaching over 40%, which is a, a significant improvement in just a two year period. I attribute that, again, to some of the leadership decisions that have been made by Admiral, Admiral Roden and his predecessor and the folks down at PERS 41 who are doing a terrific job. That along with some tools that uh, we've given our COs out there and uh, the Bureau and the detailers to incentivize you know, young men and women in the surface community to stay is making a difference. But we're also targeting, uh, frankly, we're going after uh, young women, in, especially in the surface community, because most of our female population in the officer community is in the surface community, and, and their retention is just as important as the larger picture. So. All of those efforts combined, I think we will start to see continued improvement in surface retention. Thanks for the question. All right, we're going to go a little closer to home now, sir, in fleet. We have a studio audience question. Uh, good morning, sir. MC1, Catherine from here at DMA. Uh, when I was at my first command a few years ago, um, I authored a, a proposal that was rejected at the command triad level for making the ship less accommodating for tobacco use. For example, uh, you, have, you would have to have passed PFAs and have a chit to purchase tobacco in the store or to make it out onto the smoking areas. Um, I was told that now is not the time to address smoking in the Navy. Now that we have this renewed focus on making our warfighters healthier and longer lasting, um, do you think we're getting close to the time to start making the Navy less accommodating to tobacco use, which and it's not only dangerous, but also takes a lot of time from our workforce. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would answer it this way, Pastor Cothran. Uh, if it's not intuitively obvious to every human being that smoking is bad for you, uh, then, then we've missed the point altogether. And, and we should never make it easy for people to want to pick up the habit and then continue it for a life. Uh, you're you're going to have health issues. There's no question about it. The data is, is undeniable. So we, we should continue to try to educate our, our sailors uh, if, they've, if they've started a habit to, to figure out how to kick the habit and then try to prevent those who are considering it from doing it. Um, we do make it easier than we should. Uh, I mean, let's be perfectly frank here, alcohol sales and tobacco sales have, have, have supported our MWR programs for years. And, and you, it's kind of backward from our message about the culture of health, isn't it? And so I think the Secretary of the Navy and other leadership in the Navy are very interested in, in curbing that, uh, the smoking in the Navy over time. Uh, but uh, I don't know, th there's never a bad time to talk about reducing the amount of tobacco use that occurs among sailors. And so I would continue to put that message out there. Uh, and, and ultimately someday maybe we'll be in a smoke-free Navy, uh, but we're not there yet. And, and you also have to consider that these are DOD-wide uh, policies that we have uh, that we're faced with you know army and the marine corps and the air force everybody needs to be part of that discussion so i do think the time is coming for that discussion but it isn't we're not having it right now with all of the other things we've got going on that one's not at the top of our list thank you sir thank you all right it's time to go underway now to the uss kearsarge kearsarge go ahead with your question Sir, my name is Agent Two Roos from the USS Kearsarge Medical Department. My question to you is: uh, Right now in Fifth Fleet, we have the highest security force in all of the Navy. Yet hazardous duty pay was taken away. In the foreseeable future, for Fifth Fleet, pay coming back. Okay, I, I can answer that real simply with one word: No. Uh, so hazardous duty pay is uh, governed by the combatant commander through the Secretary of Defense. And it, and, it, and it governs all services that are operating in a zone, in an area. Uh, that, was, that, that hazardous duty pay zone for Fifth Fleet encompassed the waterways of the Arabian Gulf a couple years ago, I think. Uh, and that was done at the request of the combatant commander and approved by the Secretary of Defense. For it to come back, the combatant commander would have to request it to come back and then up through the Secretary of Defense. It is not a Navy policy. Uh, and uh, I think we all would agree that when you look at a young 19, 20 year old operating on a flight deck at night uh, in the Arabian Gulf, that's pretty hazardous duty. Now we try to compensate folks for that in terms of sea duty pay 
in other pays. Uh, but uh, hazardous duty pay is one of those that is governed by DOD and not the Navy. Thanks for the question. Thank you, sir. It's time to check back in with our social media guru, Petty Officer Gabi. Petty Officer, what do you have for us? MC2, we just got another question from Twitter. Desiree would like to know, how will the elimination of below, above below zones impact promotions? Okay, Desiree, uh, the the, so let me uh, make sure you understand what we're talking about with uh, below zones, in zone, and above zones. Uh, by law, we have to track officers through promotion by year group in zones. So the zones, until the law is changed, will stay the way they are. Uh, but what we are trying to do is to not make that influence board members' decisions about promotability before an officer for selection board. Uh, what I mean by that is we don't have to visibly stamp records to tell the board members what zone you're in. The fact that you're in uh, before a board tells the board enough, and you should just be voting the record and nothing else. And that's what I mean by uh, what I term blurring the lines a little bit so that it is, it is not a, a, a very obvious statement of someone's uh, promotion eligibility based solely on your group. Uh, so uh, we, we are promoting the idea of uh, eliminating your groups over time, but until the law is changed, which is probably several years away, we are just going to deal with it inside the promotion boards uh, by not uh, visibly stamping uh, records by what zone you're in. Hopefully that answers your question. All right, thank you, sir. It's time to go to Bahrain where we have a pre-recorded question. Good afternoon, sir. This is Petty Officer Anderson from Naval Security Force Bahrain. My question is when the new coveralls are unveiled, will they be fleet wide or will they only be used during underways? Want to start? Good question. Um, thank you, sir. And I hope I got to meet you a couple of months ago or a couple of weeks ago, sir, when we were in Bahrain. Um, but right now, I think you're talking about the um, improved FRV, if that's what you're talking about. Right now, we're, um, um, there's still organizational clothing. Therefore, our sailors that are um, shore duty, um, excuse me, sea duty, physically on sea duty, um, I think you've probably heard some rumors down the road. We're probably trying to go to a coverall type um, uniform of the day. Um, that's still being um, talked about. That's still being discussed. So a couple of years on whether or not we're going to get there, shipmate. CMP, you want to add? Yeah, so Kearsarge, which is just on the line, and hopefully we can get them back, because uh, the shipmate that asked the question was wearing, I think, the new improved uh, FRV, which we're wear testing on at least two ships. Uh, one of them's Kearsarge and the other one's Kearney, both on their way to Fifth Fleet. Uh, and the, FR, the improved FRV was to deal with a lot of the complaints that we heard from the fleet uh, uh, last year and the year before about they're too hot, they don't wear well, they don't wash well, they, they look uh, awful after a few cycles through the ship's laundry. So I'm interested in uh, Kearsarge. I know you've only had them uh, maybe a week or two or three. Uh, if you can give us some feedback on what you're seeing uh, with the new improved FRVs. Uh, but that is a wear test that's going on to see how they hold up and uh, get feedback from sailors on Kearsarge and Kearney and then move, plow that back into an adjustment and, uh, and, and a redesign of the FRV as we go. Down the road, like Fleet said, whether we turn that into a working uniform or not is uh, going to be largely based on the feedback we get from Fleet sailors. Kearsarge, can you uh, give me any feedback? Good morning, sir. I'm AS1 Callaway at AIMD Department on USS Kearsarge. I'm currently one of the uh, test platforms we're actually wearing the coveralls. Some of us here are wearing the coveralls right now. A lot of the feedback that a lot of the sailors are having is there's too many pockets, too many zippers, which especially for females like myself, I have a problem with the seam. It's a little thick at the bottom, the, seam, the bottom seam. That the material is rather light. Um, we like it. It kind of breathes a little bit, especially I'm wearing the Type B. So it does breathe better. It's just way too many zippers, too many pockets for sailors to put things in, in my opinion. Okay. Well, I, we're going to get a lot more feedback on this. So I, it's, it's uh, you know, Fleet and I love being in the uniform business. Um, but one of the complaints we had on the, on the original FRV was not enough zippers, not enough pockets. Um, <laughs> yeah, da, 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 da. So maybe we overcorrected. Uh, and we'll, we'll take that feedback. If there are others out there like that, uh, we're certainly very interested in hearing from you. 
uh, especially when you get to the Arabian Gulf where it is a lot warmer than where you are right now probably. So uh, keep that feedback coming. Uh, we really need to hear from you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you, Kearsarge, for, for taking the time to come back with us. Next, we're going to go live to Norfolk. Norfolk, go ahead with your question. Hi, good afternoon. My name is PS1 Matt Montgomery from Comnav Surfland here in Norfolk, Virginia. My question is in regards to the Thrift Savings Plan, or otherwise known as TSP. Um, currently, um, active duty members are only allowed to contribute into the TSP program. Um, in the future, would it be possible for a retiree to allocate a portion of a uh, pension, if you will, into the program? Well, PS1, that is a great question that I don't have an answer for, uh, and I'll uh, if you will uh, either text us or send us your email, we'll get an answer back or we'll post uh, the answer to your question to the larger audience when we're done here. Uh, there's probably a provision in the law that either does or does not allow it, and we would have to take that on if that's uh, of something of great interest. Thanks for the question. All right. Thank you so much, Norfolk. We're going to go back with social media for the very last time where Petty Officer Gabi has been standing by all morning long monitoring Facebook and Twitter at the hashtag AskCMP. Petty Officer, how are you doing in there? MC2, things have been going great. Hashtag AskCMP is trending right now. We've been getting questions on Facebook and Twitter. But right now, I want to make sure we loop back around to when we got on a phone call from HSC2 down in Norfolk. He would like to know about aviation promotion for officers and how do we retain good leaders? Yeah, I, I'm sure the, the premise of the question has to do with the 04 board results uh, the last two years in aviation, which were below historical averages. There are a lot of reasons for it. Um, I've blogged about it. I've written about it. Uh, the Air Boss has talked about it quite a bit, just talked uh, at length about it at Tailhook uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, so there, we continue to try to understand what's driving it and to make sure that we uh, can adjust our pool of folks that are eligible for 04 in the future so that we don't disadvantage anybody. Uh, and, there, and there are several aspects to it. All I can tell you is that the Air Boss and myself and several other folks in my, in my organization are very keenly aware of uh, the promotion opportunities for young aviators to 04. And we're, we'll continue to work through this. We took a turn on it in this last board. We saw significant improvement in the board results this last year. Uh, and my hope is in the years to come, we'll continue to make improvement. So keep the faith. Don't quit on us. Uh, we're, we're, we're trying to do uh, everything we can do within our power to make sure that the opportunities uh, are closer to board average than we've seen in the last two years. CMP Fleet, I'm sure you guys are excited to hear that you're trending on Twitter now. I'm sure that was a, a career goal once you joined the Navy. So <laughs> well, check, once we check started that box. talking about uniforms, <laughs> right. we trended There you up. go, oh. sir. <laughs> Next, we're going to head out live to beautiful San Diego. San Diego, go ahead with your question. Hey, sir. CM2 Hicks at ACB1. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my question for you is since we're nearly at the end of our one third um, uh, cut in CBs, both active duty and reserve component, What's your, uh, your perspective on both short and long-term advancement opportunities and duty stations? Thank you. Yeah, we, you know, everywhere we've been, we, we've met with CBs. We were out at Wainimi, uh, boy, about six or eight months ago and heard a lot from the CB force about this. Uh, and it is, as you say, we're at the bottom. We, we have bottomed out in four structure cuts on the, on the CB force. And so naturally you would expect that it's going to take some time for advancement rates to start to come back to somewhat normal levels. And we're starting to see that. Uh, I'll have a much better uh, insight for you to, to share with you after this, the September ex advancement cycle results get to me. I'll see them in the next two to three weeks uh, so that we can issue advancement results prior to Thanksgiving so you all will have that in, in that time. Uh, it, and that'll be the next uh, series of data that we get on CB on the CB force. But you know we're we're trying to do some things that are creative, like bees to badges and the M, uh, from uh, CBs to the MA force, because we are growing the MA force, and uh, we're looking at opportunities there for CBs. But every CB we come across, uh, they they just want to be CBs and they don't want to change. I understand that it's a great community, it's a tight knit community, and uh, I think if you hang in there. If you can tolerate the lack of advancement opportunity that we've had over the last few years and look forward down the road here, 
you know, two, two to three cycles from now, I think you'll start to see them come back to normal. People have to leave in order for people to advance. And, and when you're in a downsizing market, it makes it very, very difficult to have both. Fleet, anything to add to that? No, thank you very much. Good to go. Okay. And, sir, you mentioned the Beast to Badges, which we have recently featured on AH.mil. So, of course, all you sailors out there, for your Navy information, make sure to head to AH.mil. Next, we're going to go live to, Saint, uh, to uh, Norfolk. I apologize. Norfolk, are you there? Good morning. I'm Ellis Tudy Morales, stationed at MPACE Norfolk. My question this morning is in regards to dual military BAH. I'm wondering if you can provide some insight in regards to the possible changes that may be coming up for dual military BAH. Yeah, hey, great question. We've, we've heard a lot about this from sailors when it became known that it was being considered by Congress to eliminate dual BAH. Uh, it, it went through both houses of Congress. Uh, there was a debate, and, and our understanding of uh, reading the current proposed law for, for fiscal year 16, it, it is not included in there. So uh, for at least fiscal year 16 this year, uh, dual BAH remains as it is today. Uh, I do think we're going to continue to have this, this conversation and debate, though, with, with Congress, because in their view, the American taxpayer gives us an allowance for a house, not for each individual in a house. So uh, that we, we're going to have to figure out how to get past that conversation and into the real discussion, which is dual military couples incur other costs that are not accounted for in other ways. So we, we have to have that discussion. Uh, and uh, I can assure you we will have this debate over the next year. But I think when the law is passed here in the near future, you will see that it, that, that uh, cut in dual BAH was not included in the bill. All right, great. Thank you so much, sir. Now it's time, the, the time of the show that everyone loves, and which is why I think the studio audience was under the impression that they could not go to work today, come here, meet the CMP and the Fleet Master Chief, and not have to talk at all. Sorry. And so we have uh, Petty Officer Ewing. I know you had a question early, so if you want to step up to the mic, and here's your chance to ask the CMP. Hi, the question that I had earlier was actually answered. Uh, You're good to go? Yeah. So, you know, one, one area that we haven't hit on that I, I would like to talk about is the Meritorious Advancement Program. Uh, I see a Master Chief was about to ask me, so maybe I beat you to it. You want to hit me, Master Chief? Go ahead. Sir, Master Chief Taylor, Fleet Cyber Command. Yeah. We just finished our first iteration of the Map C. Uh, if you could give us an update on that. And when do you see the Map Shore uh, being implemented out? Master Chief, thanks for the question. Mm -hmm. Uh, yesterday, I took a brief from our team to get an update on where we were. We're finally done with the first map season, and uh, we advanced tw almost 2,300 sailors in the Meritorious Advancement Program. 99 point some percent of all the quotas were used this year. That's an enormous improvement for where we were on, under the CAP program. Uh, and what, what I really liked about what I heard was that commanding officers out there really paid attention to the intent of MAP as opposed to CAP, which is to pick your best sailors and advance them meritoriously. Don't wait for the advancement cycle or the, or the test. If they're good enough in your eyes to be at the next pay grade and you've got an opportunity to advance them, use that opportunity then. Don't wait on the test. Uh, and, and what we saw from commanding officers out there was doing exactly that uh, and, and then also turning back quotas to the Navy where they didn't have an opportunity, they didn't see a, a sailor in a pay grade that, ha that they wanted to advance meritoriously to the next pay grade. And then we redistributed over 300 quotas back to the fleet in, in units where CO said, hey, I need another quota for this rate because I've got, or this pay grade, because I've got a sailor who deserves it. And we redistributed those and we've used almost all of those up. So back to the point, 99.8% of all of the quotas have been used. That's a really good start to the program. And I want to thank the COs out there who are, who are listening to the intent of this program and understanding the difference between what CAP was and what MAP is. And then uh, we, we are going to expand this next year into the shore community. Uh, we're going to take it slow. We'll open up the valve a little bit and see how we do because we've got to be very careful that we don't overpopulate certain rates at certain pay grades so that we stifle opportunity down the road off the advancement exam. But even at the levels we're at today, we're down below 10% of all advancements that are done annually are done through the MAP program. 
I'm comfortable with that level. And the secretary has challenged us to do more, and we are. And I also think there are sailors in this room, for the fleet out there, there are sailors in this room who are in rates that are largely shore-centric, who never really get an opportunity to see, an oppor- to see uh, map opportunities out at sea. So we think it's only fair that we include the shore commands and, and eliminate the timing aspects of advancement opportunities under this program and, uh, and, and, and then build some equity across sea and shore. But the focus will remain at sea for the foreseeable future, but we'll start opening up the valve, Master Chief, to your question on the shore side. And it's a good news story. Thanks for the question. All right, sir, we have a special message now from the USS Nitsi. I am ET1 Rhymes from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, on board the USS Nitsa. All I want to say is, happy birthday, Navy. <laughs> Shit, mate. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us here on this, uh, this edition of the All Hands Call with the Chief of Naval Personnel and Fleet Master Chief Beldo. If you missed any portion of the show, make sure to head to Navy.mil to catch this awesome information. Anything to add? No. Happy birthday. 240 years. You're looking young. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> everyone have a great day, and thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.